everyone. If everybody can grab their delicious snacks and take a seat, we'll get started. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming to our seminar today. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Mr. Brian Mathern, um, who came, comes over to us from LSU, where he is a PhD candidate. Um, and he is also the Learning Engagement and Development Coordinator for the National um, Council for Science and the Environment. So I actually met Brian at the SURF conference here in Mobile in November, where he gave a talk about the Environmentors program, um, where he's the chapter lead at LSU. Um, and the goal of the program is to mentor high school students from underrepresented backgrounds and foster opportunities in science-related fields. Um, since he was so great at it at LSU, he is now the national liaison for the Environmentors program. Um, and in his spare time, he's finishing up his PhD, um, where he focuses on microbial ecology um, and doing some really cool um, bioinformatics, um, next generation sequencing work, and um, with a focus on human pathogens. Um, he also has a background in environmental consulting and toxicology, um, so he has a very diverse um, career path and wears a lot of hats, and I'm glad that he could make time to be with us here today. So welcome, Mr. Mathern. All right, so thank you for having me today. Um, as Elizabeth said, my name is Brian Mathern, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, my journey through the program with Environmentors. So we'll start with what Environmentors is, what we've done. Uh, it'll be mostly focused, but we'll also talk about um, some of the other chapters that are out there and maybe provide some opportunities for you all to engage with some of them that are local. And I wanted to then talk about um, some work I've done um, with a high schooler where I was trying to break down uh, marine biology re or marine microbiology research and bioinformatics work and make it more inclusive for somebody that just doesn't have a background in that. Um, so it was inspired on work that uh, involved fish guts. So that's kind of where my title is inspired from because it takes guts and it also takes guts to be who uh, can know how to engage people and, and learn how to work with someone who's underserved and be their ally or their advocate and so you know it takes being a good listener um, and then sticking up for them and uh, so I really thought it was a very good multifaceted title um, so you know first things first uh, acknowledge who's come before me so um, LSU Environmentor started in, in 2010 and so we've had a good number um, of former coordinators that have gone on um, I also would like to thank our uh, our dean environment, Dean Delia, um, for being a big champion of our program. He brought the program uh, to LSU and, and, and supports us in a multitude of ways. Um, for those of you that do outreach work uh, with schools, having a teacher at that school that is, you know, a champion for those students and can be that, that connection is huge. And so I, uh, she's the beginning and her ability to, uh, to work with us, um, it, we just wouldn't be successful w without her. Um, and also, I'd like to thank uh, my former director, uh, Linda Hooper Bowie, who's been a, a great mentor to me. She's been fantastic. And then now our interim director, Melinda Suter, has been a huge help. Um, so, a couple of things to also point out, too, is that um, so I work with the National Council for Science and the Environment. That is who is uh, the Environmentors program. Um, so, they oversee uh, currently it's eight chapters, but we're growing. And that's actually part of my job is to take what I've learned at LSU um, and Kind of build on that and build out these best practices and and try to expand chapters throughout the nation um, and so also too my position is funded through louisiana sea grant um, and so i i couldn't have a graduate assistantship without them so i'd like to thank them as well all right so three parts part one i'm going to talk about lsu environmentors all right so what is environmentors it's kind of a fun name um, we, again, part of the National Council for Science and the Environment, we place underrepresented uh, or underserved high school students with science research mentors. So we challenge these uh, students to come in and to carry out the entire scientific method, and we have mentors that help guide them along the way. So kind of as I was talking with people throughout the past few days about that, what's interesting is you look at a lot of these research experiences, 
whether it's for undergrads or for or for high school students, it tends to be a more cherry-picked approach where it's, let's get the best of the best. Let's bring them in here, um, we're going to train them up, and, and it's going to be this massive pipeline program. And so our program's unique in that we're looking at students not based on necessarily their ability to do science uh, from how they self-identify, but really just their ability to commit. And so we're trying to be more inclusive in that sense, where they, they maybe don't see themselves as a scientist, um, but yet you know, they're interested in what we're doing um, because we bring them to our campus to LSU that it, it is something that's exciting for them. They get to see themselves in a university setting. Um, as one of my students put it, you know, they felt like it was college-based and helped prepare them um, for school in that, in that sense. And so um, that really helps tie things together for them and, and, and make it understand that you know, college is attainable for them. Um, so our mentorship process, in particular at LSU, is we, we work with uh, graduate students and undergrads that serve as their mentors, and we always have a two-to-one ratio. And that, that's something we've kind of played around with over the years. Um, but we've found that two to one's most successful, um, and the reason why is because graduate students think they're busy all the time because they have exams and things, and, and so when they need to take time off, it helps you have someone else that can be there. But then you also have that dynamic where maybe one of the students, uh, when they're, they're working with the high schooler, they're the better communicator, but perhaps the other one's the better uh, scientist, better researcher, and so you can kind of have that dynamic um, in communicating and relating to that student. Um, and then when we've had one, one mentor per student, um, a lot of times it can be a struggle, whether it's just balancing time, commitments, um, or if you have a student that just emotionally isn't wanting to connect and you know, not having that extra person to bounce it off. So that's, that's been the most reliable setting for us. Um, some other chapters, they, they kind of do the more traditional model where um, they'll bring a student in and, and kind of throw them into a lab environment and just expose them to a bunch of different things and the student might make a poster based on what lab they're in. Um, I disagree with that model because I find that they never become invested in their work. Um, they, they don't create their own hypothesis, and that's kind of where I'll get to later about that hypothesis uh, testing and investigative-based learning um, and how that, that really kind of can drive the experiment. Um, so our program, as I said, been at LSU since 2010, so we're coming up on that big 10th year anniversary. Um, we have worked with uh, 56 students, and that doesn't sound like a lot over 10 years, right? But the reason why it's not a lot is because almost 80% of our students come back year after year. So several of our students have done it all four years of high school. Um, we're limited by the number of spots based on transportation and, uh, and the number of mentors that commit to our program every year. Because again, we're always trying to have that two to one ratio. So if I fail to you know, recruit enough mentors or, or what have you, it, um, I'm not gonna allow a big uh, group of students to come in. Um, so that's something that, that I've found is important. Um, so the, the school they work with um, has a you know, low graduation rate, just under 80%, but our students are right now at 98%, and so they're outperforming their peers. And again, to me that's meaningful because we're not cherry picking the top students. So we're getting students that they're all across the spectrum academically. Um, their school has what's called a magnet program. I, I'm not sure who's familiar with magnet programs, but you know, they try to you know, bring in the best and brightest but their school also has a non-magnet program, so we don't necessarily select in the magnet program. We get kids that are in both. Um, so it's kind of an interesting way to see, are, are we being effective? And so just based on graduation numbers, we, we know that we are finding some success, right? Um, and then over the course of our program, we know that 12 have gone on now to graduate college. Uh, many others, are, they're going on beyond that, um, to, uh, not beyond that, but many of have gone into other fields, whether it's community college or, or trade school or even the military. Um, and so we've had good success with, with, with seeing nice outcomes for these students in that regard. So this is kind of my version of a SWOT analysis that I put together. People asking about the value in the program. And so I had a question from Anika last night that was asking me about, you know, when you're trying to and you're trying to figure out um, how to do it and what it's worth, you know, people look at costs. I mean, because, you know, have finite amounts of money for resources to use. And some things to think about is, for us, our biggest transportation. And so we had a really good partnership. It dried up and to make that up. And so it was like, well, how are we gonna, transportation, but don't provide come. 
And, and that's, you know, they have families that may not be able to conform reliably based on how they work. Um, Baton Rouge, most of our schools, we don't have true neighborhood schools in that everybody who goes to that school lives around it. They can live all around Baton Rouge because of the way the magnet system is and school choice and everything. And so logistically, we need to provide transportation. Um, you know, meals. I mean, kids are hungry. It's an after school program. no real benefit. It's just junk food, right? And so we've used the opportunity at times to, to reinforce salads in, but we're, we're bringing in decent food and um, perhaps the spice and, and these different foods. And, you know, what can they learn from that? Well, there's actually a great deal of biodiversity they can learn types of spices that are out there, for example. Food. And you looked at the area that got the forest area and cinnamons and, and all these other herbaceous foods. And so a really great way where they could see it um, and then incorporate that knowledge about what is biodiversity and, and how that you know, you know comes into play with things that they're, they can see and do every day. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you guys here at the Dolphin Island, I see a lot about field trips and the importance of that. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, that's what people here um, bringing in K through 12 students, undergrad students, um, have, you know, wonderful SUARM over there to, to bring people in and give them that experiential learning to, to do a hands-on um, activity, um, get and saying, hey, you know, this boat, we have life preservers, um, <laughs> we have other standards, right? So that's huge for kids, um, and it's huge for adults too. I, I, I. I get bored seeing and doing the same things every day, right? So going out and, 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 and meeting new people, seeing the world's different in different places, and, and it really broadens their horizons. And also, too, societal. So again, coming back to working with students who uh, we can say or maybe don't, they're not targeted for different um, programs and everything, but they are maybe come from communities where education is not a priority and so we have to be able to overcome that but again then the benefit of that is promoting that inclusive science um, and the outreach to, to bring into a more force um, to have a more STEM workforce which in Louisiana um, STEM jobs are, are petrochemical industry and other industries country is that this is an important thing to is a huge benefit to them. Um, and then, of course, you know, time. There's that time commitment where, you know, and this, this kind of comes down more for the men. Commit to two hours a week because I'm busy. And I always like to tell them when I hear that, that, no, you're not. Like, I call myself a dad school, but I have two kids. I got to work. Uh, you know, I got to get home and do what I call. And, and so, if I can make time for it, so can you. And it's, it's one of those relationships that uh, needs to be able to f be formed over time. So you have to have that commitment to come in and meeting with your student on a regular basis and coach them up on their post and they're done. So these, these relationships, they're, they're fostered throughout the year, they're built on. And then when the student goes on, you have them come back to you and, and, and really kind of keep up with what's going on. So, uh, many of the students that I've been working with now for four or five years, they, they ask me how to help them uh, fill out an application because um, a lot of them, they just use those re same resources at home. Uh, and so that's what's important about building these relationships. Um, some of it's trust and some of it's just really being, being open and accessible to them. So implementing inclusive science is something that I really wasn't even in my lexicon until the past uh, six or eight months. And it was something that I didn't really understand what that meant. I, you know, when I, when I think of inclusion and, and diversity, you know, it, it, it tends to fall more based on, on gender or race, right? But, you know, inclusion and science, uh, and this term that's coming about is more about for people that don't see themselves as a scientist. And some of that is based in, you know, these predefined historical, whether they're social norms or, or, or however you want to go about it. So 
So by bringing students into campus, you know, I always like to put them in a lab coat so they can see themselves and visualize themselves as, as a scientist, put on the goggles, whatever. Um, have them meet people from a diverse background to see that there are other people out there doing it um, that look like them um, and that come from a wide variety of backgrounds. And it's kind of about thinking why people um, are underrepresented in STEM and it's because many communities that, that we're working with some of it's just that lack of awareness of the different types of jobs that are out there. And, and so when I thought scientist as a kid, um, I just thought it was a, you know, a guy in a lab coat, you know, pipetting stuff all day long. And that's not very exciting, right? I mean, maybe it can be if you have a really good podcast on your headphones and you like quiet time. And um, you know, I used to do a lot of books on tape, but um, you know, that lack of career awareness is important. So that's where we bring students in and it's like, okay, uh, you like engineering, here's how engineering applies to this. Um, you say you like biology, here's how we can study biology in this way, and they can see how that, that connects to different things that they're doing in their lives, and that there's a whole world out there of different opportunities. Um, so inadequate skill development is not just a problem for underrepresented students. As I was talking this morning, I mean, it's a lot of undergrads, uh, you know, from even more privileged backgrounds struggle with this, and, and so what I like about uh, what we're trying to do with, with Environmentors is one, is we're working with these students throughout the year and we're kind of breaking things into chunks. So uh, we go through the entire scientific method throughout the year, but they're gaining skills along the way, right? So you're learning about how to do an experimental design, but before you can really do that, you have to do some background research. So they're, they're working on how to, how to go and do a web search and, and how to you know, distill information um, we learn how to do graphing and, and all these different things that apply to so many different fields and, and really hopefully are bringing up those skill sets. And then two for our mentors, and this is something that for a long time with our program I know was kind of forgotten about. Our, our mentors are learning how to break down more complicated topics and talk about it on a level that a high schooler can understand, right? And so that's something that, that is really important if you, you, know, you want to go and especially those of you that are more environmentally focused and you tend to have more politically charged topics that you have to talk about and go and, and discuss those things with people who aren't content experts, you have to net be able to know how to find a way to put it on a level where they can understand. And so things like, okay, you're critical about the effects of climate change and sea level rise, but you like to go fishing and here are things that are you know, happening to your fishing populations. And so these are the same sorts of skills that you can pick up by doing that with, with students. Um, and another thing, too, to talk about with inclusive science is these, these faulty educational pipe, pipelines. So a lot of schools, you know, it's about who can I get to come in and they'll want to go to our college and then they're going to go off in this career. And a lot of it, it starts with data and metrics. Um, and to me, that was kind of a hard lesson to learn that that's not always the best way to do things. And so it's really more about building pathways, and that goes back to, again, that career awareness and, and pathways then give them what they see what opportunities are out there, and to also see that there's, there's different routes to get there, right? Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. You know, a lot of these students think that everybody did something on a linear trajectory, and you know, that's, that's not the case for a lot of people. You know, we kind of bounce around, we might you know, start one thing, do another. You could be like my wife and change majors five times. You know, it, we don't always know what our calling is right away, and so that's what's important to not pigeonhole people into these pipelines and helping them, you know, choose what they what their path is in life. So one of the things I'm always charged with is creating meaningful experiences. Again, I'm preaching to the choir at a C lab where uh, I would hope that a lot of you are, are engaged in this. Um, one of the first things we're trying to do is, is, you know, show our students that they have the ability to do science, right? Um, you know, science is something that is, is, you know, the average person can do it because there's things like citizen science. And, you know, maybe not at a high level, but we're all able to do um, different things. We all have different skill sets. We all have different gifts that we can contribute. So we always bring them into our labs, um, we give them lab tours so they can see what types of research are out there. Because um, most of our students, they maybe had a biology or chemistry class. Uh, if you're lucky, physics, they don't really know a lot about the different types of research that are out there. Um, you know, Louisiana, this area is a coastal state. 
Um, we're heavily driven by the Mississippi River, so we use what's in our own backyard um, to kind of tell a story about what's important to us and you know how it impacts everyone. Um, so we have great local facilities that we can tour. This uh, this image right here, and I know our, our some people in our college don't like me to show this because it's actually through the College of Engineering and not through the College of the Coast and Environment, but it's a Mississippi River uh, model that's the size of about two basketball courts, and they can actually flow sediments down this, and they can look and see how the diversions are theoretically working, um, sediment deposition, and the neat thing about this model is there's stands underneath it, and so they can, they can raise and lower it to account for subsidence, and then they also can project a, you know, accurate GIS map. So it's a really good uh, visual tool, but it also serves a great research purpose. So um, as, as one of my students said that when she was in there, it was like being a kid in a candy store. You could just things and, uh, that she was so excited about. Um, and then bringing them down to places uh, like our equivalent would be LUMCON, uh, the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium. So we bring them down there, put them on boats, um, let them handle fish, and, and really builds out that kinesthetic learning where they're doing things, learning through an act, and, and they're building on those skills. And, and so the other thing is important to try to tie it all together. So whether it's showing them how it's important in their daily lives, uh, or if you, you have kind of more of a, an approach where wetland and here's where the water comes in, and then we'll talk about the fisheries, and so they can kind of see how everything is interconnected because and they're constantly changing and there's lots of different var variables that tie into that. And so it helps them kind of see that, you know, it's not just any one thing that's impacting things that they're interested in studying. Um, so again, we, we focus a lot on coastal and science marine education um, to kind of drive our program. Um, and some of that's with the research, which I'll talk about in a moment, but it's also, again, what we have right here, uh, or right there, Baton Rouge. So we're right along the banks of the Mississippi River and we can do everything from showing them how you have nutrient pollution that comes from upstream. Um, you know, now a big thing that we can talk to them about is what has happened in Mississippi uh, all the way over here in Alabama with whenever the Bonnie Carey Spillway opens up and that fresh water has to go somewhere and what that's doing. And so that how this river is, drying, uh, is driving so many different ecosystems. Um, issues um, across multiple states and how that, that same system is also creating this bountiful fishery that our state, where we're at, um, you know, is highly dependent upon. Um, so it's really uh, great that you, know, you take them out there and show them um, what coastal restoration, and so we've had the opportunity to take them and see where, where marsh restoration is uh, actually being successful and, and, and they can see what a mixing zone looks like, you know, you salt and fresh water coming together and it makes that, that clear visual picture about what's happening to those sediments and, and these diversions. And, and of course, you know, we can all talk about storm protection. And, and, and so getting them out there, putting them on, on the that I believe in, it's something that when I was a student, it was very impactful for me. And it, it's something that, you know, beyond my own anecdotal stories, it's, you know, it's clearly working with our students. Um, Science as a field is very interdisciplinary. Um, at LSU, the College of the Coast and Environment, it, it really kind of it, it sits more on that, that coastal ecology side. And you're, you're looking at everything from atmospheric chemistry to biogeochemical cycles, social science, which is something that. Um, but all of our students have interest in these, these things, right? And so it's nice that they can be exposed to different areas of STEM within our program. And their projects, uh, while they do largely a wide variety of topics, they're very aquatic centered. And so, I mean, and it just makes sense. We're, we have on our campus and, and, and the various bayou systems that are now just drainage canals. Um, and so they can test and do lots and lots of uh, interesting water quality investigations on that. And so that's always been something I've had in the back of my mind. It'd be kind of neat to see if you could compare their data. Done with questionable high school. Even though they did have really good science mentors along the way, right? Let's see. So one of the things that we try to work on with them is something that, you know, as I'm, as a grad student, and 
career is more interesting. And it starts with in front of people and talking. It starts with about not just what you're doing in your work, but what's important to you. So one of the things I always do, I don't try to give them something big and intimidating to talk about. It's let's learn to get up in front of a group and talk about our favorite movie and hit all the high points. You know, who's the main character? Um, what's the funny part that happened? How'd it conclude? So it gets them thinking about what are those key points, breaking it down into its, you know, the most simplest terms, and then being able to get that across the group. And we've even done it where let's play a game, play the title of the movie, and try to use those those key points and see if people can guess it. And so that kind of helps them think about things that they're familiar with, but then utilizing a skill challenging um, if they were just trying to do it right off at the bat at the end of the year where they're, let's go and talk about science. So that promotes that confidence. If they're not speaking early and often, they go in front of judges because we do a science fair at the end of the year in poster sessions, um, they're going to be extremely uncomfortable. Um, and as we kind of go through the year, as we practice these elevator speeches using methods like Ant, some of you may have heard of, um, they grow that deeper understanding of their own work. They start to feel important. Um, you know, yeah, right. And not that important. And so that's what I always try to to, to pull out of these students is that okay, that you're going to go in there and tell them that you got to use a technique called PCR, and that, that sounds fancy to you because you're in high school, but in reality, that like. That's not the end game of what you were trying to do. You were trying to look at how these things interacted. You were trying to look at and, and see if this is harmful. Um, this is just a technique. And so getting them to understand that. Um, and also, too, by completing the scientific method, what's the last scientific method? Yes, thank you. That's what I'm trying to do here to you guys. Yeah. So yeah, that's that last step. So they, they go through the whole process, right? So they, they help find the experiment, um, they have the hypothesis, they did the background work, and they got to communicate it. And so that's, we have a, we have a poster session, scientific competition. Um, and my wish and my hope is to get them more into these student-driven publications uh, for high school students. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's not just building a volcano, uh, you know, with vinegar and baking soda. So it's, it's beyond what typical high school students are usually doing, and even beyond what a lot of undergrads I've seen are doing, which is nice. Um, empowered learning is huge. So learning by doing, learning by showing and teaching um, are great ways for students to become more engaged with what they're doing. It helps uh, them take command of what they've been learning. And, and, and then uh, also using what's different um, outlets through things like service. Um, so they're, they're empowered by being able to do um, things that benefit other people. And uh, near peer mentoring is something as well where they're getting to, to talk with somebody who's kind of in a similar spot to them, maybe even a little bit younger. Like we've done some work where our students get to be um, mentors and put on some displays and talk to, uh, to young kids. And, and so that's a really great opportunity for them to kind of feel cool and empowered with what they're doing. And, and again, by, by presenting and, and, and commanding a room, so we always take turns kind of going around the room and, and getting them to be up there and, and, and be comfortable with what they're talking about and why what they're doing is fun and, and why what they're doing is, you know, is, is important in the long run or, or perhaps what you know, they were trying to do but it didn't work. Because um, that's something too for them to understand that you know not everything's going to work because that's science because people who are in science have to learn to accept failure a lot and that's something that most of us struggle with so um, in outreach you know exploring your world is not just the motto that environmentalism lives by it's something that is, is huge for kids especially if they're coming from communities where they don't really get to, to get out there much um, a lot of our, our students haven't left the state. Um, or even the, or the region. Uh, we have our winners from our local science fair. They go on to Washington, D.C. and are often getting on an airplane for the first time. And so going outside their bubble uh, is huge. Um, they, they learn that maybe some of the bad things that they're experiencing back home, they're not so bad in other places. And, and, and also, too, maybe people are kinder in one area and they're, they're happier in another. And, and, 
So they get to see that, you know, stuck in that community that they're in. There's places in the world where they can fit in. And so it, it's really important um, to bring them outside um, to help them learn to be uncomfortable. Because if you are not uncomfortable, you're going to stay in the bubble, right? Um, you know, a lot of what grad school does is try to be around and, and get you to go to different places. Or you can be like myself and be academically inbred. But, um, you have to challenge your students, um, and you also have to challenge yourself. And, and again, it takes guts to do that, right? You have to click on the title. Um, part two. So this is the part where I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. I don't like to talk about myself, but I'll, I'll be a little bit more um, about my journey, about my background, and how I found myself here today. Um, so I, I, I started off, I uh, did my bachelor's at LSU, and I thought I wanted to be a doctor like my dad, and I really liked what he could do um, in the community, and it kind of took me a while to realize that I don't really want to be responsible for life, and that was kind of a hard realization to accept. But I had been exposed a lot um, growing up in Biloxi, Mississippi, living on the Gulf Coast. Uh, I was very to, to be exposed to marine science, going to, to different camps on the Gulf, and, and really just seeing what was out there. And so when I was in college, I ended up shifting my focus from just pure biology to concentration, and I was fortunate to spend a summer at the lab, and that's really what started helping me realize this is where I need to be. Um, so I, I went in after my, my bachelor's and did my master's at LSU, and I didn't know you could get paid to go to school, which was kind of interesting. So if there's anybody that's an undergraduate here and you hadn't figured that all out already, you're doing the wrong thing. Um, so I started off uh, wanting to save the wetlands. So I went to the environmental science department and started off with uh, an ecotox uh, course. And that's kind of what I stuck to. But um, I had a professor that, you know, she had microbiology. I still like microbiology. It kind of falls into that healthcare, public health aspect that I, I do like about you know what my dad was doing and what I wanted to do. Um, so it was interesting to me. I had taken several microbiology courses as an undergrad, and it was enjoyable. And so um, I, I got involved in their lab and started working on uh, different types of vibrio, looking at human pathogens, looking at their presence in water and sediments and oysters. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed it, um, but then whenever I was finishing, you know, I, I, I kind of was like, well, I, I don't know what I really would do with this, but I had this background in talks, and I, I kind of had a, you know, a point in my life where uh, it was right before I was married, my wife was moving up to Texas, and I decided, like, and I started working at the University of North Texas and, and teaching labs, and it was an experience that I thought I was going to hate because I hated taking labs as an undergrad, and so I looked at it as my opportunity to kind of put my own spin on that. And so I found that I actually kind of like teaching. Um, but after a while, I, I go to environmental consulting, and, and I did that for almost four years where a lot of ups and downs. Uh, you, know, you start to learn that what you're really good at, um, what you like and what you don't like about a job, and you know, I, I kind of ultimately felt like um, I was missing something. And I, it, it it took a lot of uh, <laughs> took a lot of help from my wife, <laughs> and uh, went back to uh, Baton Rouge where I was able to uh, with my master's of kind of carrying some of the work that I had been doing, and and then building on that. And so when I had graduated in '09 um, with my master's, um, they didn't have this environmentalist program. They actually started it the year after I left. And so when I came back in 20 this sounds like a cool program. It sounds like something that I would like to do. I wish I had it when I was a master's student. And so I just started off as a mentor. And it, it, to me, it felt like a good primer for how to do research again. I hadn't done research in a while. Um, you know, working with a high school student, helping them do an experimental design and, and breaking things down. And, and it kind of really reinvigorated me. Uh, and then at the end of the year, I found myself uh, helping out the coordinator. Um, and then when he moved on, I took it over and, and, and worked with one of the other long coordinators um, who was also on her way out and so ever since then um, I've now been running it on my own um, with the exception of our director that um, as she always has told me that basically she's just there to, to be my sounding board and, and to you know put out any big fires with the city administration so I, 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 
I'm very much uh, have been responsible for it. Um, so I, I will I will accept uh, all the you know all the praises we've had over the years, and uh, but I also will accept the failures of the program. But you know anyway, that that's been my responsibility over the years, and so. I thought I was coming back to, to knock out my PhD in like two years and, and you know because I really didn't take any classes and I had a good base of research to work with and I had some ideas for the, the continuation of my dissertation but I, I got more and more involved with this mentorship program more responsibilities got put on me I found myself in this weird kind of hybrid role where I didn't really fit in because yeah I'm a grad student but I'm a little bit older than some people I'm not a lot older I wouldn't call myself an adult learner like we've we used to kind of make fun of some people that would go back to school later in life, but um, I was somebody that uh, I was asked to write grants, I was asked to do fundraising, and I'm, I was asked to lead what I like to call the largest informal lab on campus, because at times we would have upwards of 40 people between mentors and mentees running various projects throughout the year. Um, so not a lot of grad students have to do things like that. And it, it was hard for me at times, or is hard for me at times, you know, to see that out that degree pretty quick because they you know they got their research and they just kind of go 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 and they can sleep in the lab and you know do all that fun stuff but you know I have kids at home and a wife and I get yelled at if I'm not home for dinner at a certain time and you know and so it that is a challenge for me to, to kind of figure out like okay this is my passion but where am I going to go with this and so that last few years um, I've been working more and more closely with uh, the National Council for Science and the Environment because um, they're our parent organization and they've had some turnover with their national liaison, so I was consulting with new ones and they brought me in to kind of help them out. And I've been using what I've learned to, to help um, kind of build some new chapters, consult with new chapters getting started, and so that's where they then have asked me to take on this larger role nationally and, and that's their goal for me to continue on with this um, whenever I graduate. And so that's. It's a, it's a pathway that opened up for me. It's not something that I, I, I foresaw myself going in at all, um, but it is something that I am very passionate about and very excited. And you know, it, it's really more of something to, to kind of talk more one-on-one -on -one with. But our, our, so the final part here, uh, talk about a little bit of research. And I know people always like to, to go and look at all the numbers um, in talks, right? But this is work um, that I was challenged to do with a high school student, okay? so. Uh, that in mind with her experimental design, but it's how I, I broke down in a microbiology project and, and then worked with the timing that we had uh, and then within the constraints of budgets and things like that. So year one, um, this is my student um, in 2019 from high school, but this was her junior year project. It was actually her, her third year in the program. And she was really curious about things that can make people sick. And so I started talking about some of the work that I had done with Vibrio, and, and, and she, you know, was like, hey, let's, let's look at Vibrio and oysters from different seafood markets. So she had some other mentors that were helping her with going around and collecting um, oysters um, at various markets um, from different locations. And, and then they went into my lab, and they were doing different testing uh, for different types of Vibrio. Um, so she got to learn all about plating methods and PCR and, and really had enjoyed that. So those were, that was kind of the big outcome learn about color techniques, um, understanding that, you know, doing a plating-based experiment with a high school student who only comes to your lab one day a week means you have to do most of the work and not her. Um, so that's, you know, that was challenging and, you know, it's like how to keep them engaged. But what was neat is some of the concepts that, that she got to learn was understanding, you know, risk, for example, with real and high abundance, um, are, am I at risk if I am exposing myself to them through ingesting these things? And she got to learn about uh, the seasonal effects because we were doing a Vibrio project in the early spring, which if you know anything about Vibrio, when they like to grow, that's not a good time, right? So, so she, she had to kind of work with me and her mentors to kind of re rethink some of her methods and figure out a way to still have meaningful results. Uh, learn, and she gets to learn concepts like viable but non-culturable, um, you know, but understanding what those limitations are in experimental design uh, really helped her and it drove her for her next uh, her next year where she wanted to build on that project. Um, and so did my slides get out of whack? No, they did not. Maybe they did. Actually, yes. So I had a few challenges with that NEST project. And that's okay. Um, so my first uh, thing was to try to figure out a way um, 
to build on her next project. So my solution to that was to use microbiology research as an excuse to, you know, hook line and sinker, go out and fish. And uh, and really, I got involved with a real project. It wasn't just me uh, going fishing, but um, we wanted to look at microbes in fish guts, and I thought that would be kind of an interesting thing that she could compare to oysters, and there's been a little bit of research that's been coming out about it, so I thought it'd be kind of uh, neat for her to see that. And so I had an opportunity um, to do some sampling um, with one of the professors I work with, and then I took those samples and her oyster samples up to the Oklahoma, where uh, our lab does some work with the Institute of Environmental Genomics, and uh, I was doing some filter bar samples and was able to put this on the run, so I did all the DNA extraction, on oysters, redfish, speckled trout, and killifish, so kind of looking at two larger species that move throughout um, inshore fisheries. Uh, they can be a different uh, salinities. Same with killifish, which, are, you know, they're also tolerant of a wide variety of salinities, but they're not moving around as much, and so that was kind of the idea. And I'm looking at, of course, these stuff features. I was able to do 16S R&R gene sequencing on them. Um, and then bring back some data for her to look at. So, so yeah, challenge one, so we're trying to expand upon our previous work. That second challenge, how do you simplify microbiome research um, for a high schooler? So my solution, I had to start with what she knew. So she knew a little bit about the Vibrio that she had learned in her previous year. And, and so how do you study Vibrio within a microbiome? So that was kind of the jumping off point. Um, that was kind of the initial forming of that hypothesis. And so, again, we're using her, her prior knowledge and we're expanding upon that. Um, and that's very important because, you know, most high schoolers have very limited, very focused uh, knowledge, so you have to be able to you know, target that and then, and then build from there. And then you help them see those connections. So she was able to see, okay, like these oysters live in the water here, here's these fish. Maybe these same bacteria and oysters in these fish. And so she was able to kind of start seeing the possibilities here. Um, so then my challenge in year, you know, the, the third challenge I had that year was, all right, make the process more inclusive. And what I mean by that is, um, do you know anything about how most uh, bioinformatics works? Because it looks like the matrix. Um, so you, you have to take the red pill and you have to learn to type basic codes and commands and um, it's, it's a lot of, um, you know, data processing and there's a huge learning curve to it, okay? Um, and so that's where the solution was, there are some good um, tools out there that you can, you can do some of the heavy lifting on the command line and then graphical user in interface or GUI, right? And there's ways for them to then click around and see, okay, here's some key taxa that, that maybe I wanna study, like Vibrio um, and then some of these enterobacteria. And, and she was able to kind of click around and, and select for them and we were able to push that out and she able to start looking at how we could study those bacteria and relationships to each types of fish, and, and, and she was able to hypotheses based on what she was able to see from that, and then we could extract the data she wanted to work with and go and test those hypotheses. Um, so that's where our solution is, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that hypothesis-driven research, and, you know, you're, again, building on what they know, and, and that makes it more passionate for them, and it helps them you know, think about it critically. So just to kind of show you a little bit about our work, because I know we're kind of getting towards the end here. Um, you know, we looked at um, oysters here that, that were collected, and, and again, it's, these were oysters collected from different places in, you know, slightly different times and different stations, but still, um, oysters are oysters, and um, so she thought that they would have um, more bacteria in them than fish. That was her hypothesis. And so just based on, you know, total log abundances, Interestingly enough, redfish had higher. Um, and so that was a really interesting way for her to see that. Um, so we got to put these nice big graphs together. Um, and that was actually a really key piece for her is, you know, she could understand this type of graph really easily, but then looking at a box plot, like something like that's maybe not as approachable for a high school student. And so again, there's that challenge. How do you break that down to where they can understand that, okay, first focus on what are the mean values, right? And then looking at, um, all right, where are the extremes and what that could mean in your data set? And so breaking that down for her to see how things are truly related, because you know, as we started talking about, total abundance may not tell you anything. And so then looking at, um, looking at average values, looking at things uh, such as um, 
you know, maybe the evenness, for example, which is, you know, kind of looking at in the next slide where we talked about that. And that was was interesting to her. Um, with statistically, the, the redfish and the oysters seem to have actually a more similar microbiome. And that's where we talk about things such as where uh, redfish feed. It was interesting because when you look at redfish and, and, and seckle trout, for example, they're both drawn. They're, they're, they're similar. You think they would have a more similar microbiome, but perhaps they don't. And, and so that might have to do um, where they're feeding tropically. Um, and then the higher order thinking exercise. So usually most people think that, you know, in order to execute higher order thinking, you have to have a knowledge to be able to get to that point. Um, but I don't think that's always the case because my student was able to, to analyze the data that we put in front of her. Um, she was able to create an experimental design uh, or, or really create a hypothesis to then that we were able to test, then evaluate those new results based on that. And so, for example, she wanted to build on what she had done the previous year again, looking at Vibrio. And so we were able to, to look at Vibrio in different species and see that you know, redfish had more Vibrio, and, and that in itself, you know, because we didn't dive deeply into the data. I was working with a high school student, right? But it, but still, um, you're able to, and I was able to explain that to her. It's like, okay, again, we're looking at abundances. It, you know, it tells you one thing, but it doesn't tell you that, you know, is, does that mean if I'm eating oysters and they have, you know, maybe a more moderate amount of, of, of this Vibrio, and is that a high level? It, they could, and so that's where we could talk about limitations and, and data interpretation. Um, and it really opens up a whole slew of things that you can you can bring about. And so, again, this is Brianna. This is her final year. Uh, she got third place at our at the National Science Fair with this, um, which was great. And um, some some of the things that she learned were, you know, she learned about what is micro microbial ecology, what is a microbiome. Um, learned about how to diversity, richness and um, also looked at how, in, in a lot of what we're doing now, microbial ecology is using your, your initial data from and, and then confirming based on these new hypotheses forming. Um, and one thing that really stuck out to her, and is, I, I've done some interviewing with her, we've we're, we're been working on a publication for that, is that you know data visualization was what really kind of drove this for her, being able to see things uh, set up in different ways is what made it more clear. Use one type of chart versus another, for example. Um, so, kind of my my takeaways to uh, kind of to put everything together and my experiences in working and and youth and diversity inclusion and and research with high school students is you know how to communicate with them. But um, so my three tips for mentoring, right? So become invested in your protege, and that, to me that's the most important. You, you're forming that bond. Um, I, sometimes I like to say that their failures are your failures, but it, it's also more about you know letting them know that failing is okay. That you know when you when you first test a hypothesis, you know it, it may you may find that you know it was either you know it was negative and you're like well I failed and like well that's just kind of part of it. Perhaps your methods didn't work, and so understanding that you have to then you try something new a different way and, and embrace that that kind of that system in, in, within the scientific method. Um, and again, when you're talking to them and, and putting concepts in relatable terms, it doesn't mean you know working with kids. You have to make a rap video and you know about the, the scientific method. You don't have to do that. It, it's just you know finding out what they're interested, in, meeting them, meeting them kind of in the middle. Um, and really, too, I find that uh, you know being vulnerable, showing them your own personal like your weaknesses, things that you struggle with, it, it makes you more approachable to them and relatable. And then finally, you know, letting that hypothesis drive the experiment. I, I, I think most scientists can relate to that. It's, it helps you get past that, the, you know, the, the doldrums of, of sitting in the lab doing repetitive things and going, okay, what, what are we going to find once this is all there? Um, and I think that's really key, especially when working with, uh, with young people in science. So that, I thank you for uh, your time. If you have any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. And uh, again, thank you. Typically, we sh we've had 14 on average, and in the past few years, it's been closer. It's been under 10, and, and that, again, it's been kind of more related to uh, 
the amount of mentors from able to recruit because our college is kind of it's a smaller college at LSU and we we actually get mentors from all over campus um, I actually think having a larger number of students while it can be challenging from a resources standpoint um, is more beneficial I found that it's, when the numbers have gone down it, it you start having that weird sense of one student can't be there then another student suddenly doesn't want to be there and it, it just really trickles down so yeah um, but a lot of the chapters nationally they, they tend to be five to seven students Actually, we meet once a week throughout the school year. Fall, they come in. Usually by October, we start having events with mentor, potential mentors and students, and we do some pairing. Uh, we'll do like we call it speed dating, where they, you know, you kind of sit around in a room and everybody gets to kind of meet everybody, and then they start off on experience. And it's, you know, they're on campus three hours for that, you know, and but that first hour we usually do a lesson with them, maybe something hands-on, take them on a tour. And it's, uh, it's those two hours um, throughout the semester. So they, it's really time invested isn't, isn't as much as something like an REU. It, um, so it, but it depends, and it depends on how motivated the student is because, you know, some of the kids, they're just happy to, to have a place to go after school. And, and that creates a challenge, too, from, you know, the mentor-mentee relationship where the mentor is hoping they're going to get this kid that is really interested in the science when in reality it's like they have a more unique opportunity to kind of, take someone under their wing and, you know, kind of mentor them in other ways that they weren't expecting. Mm 